word. It's the last word of the Lord to Israel before he is silent for 400 years. Now, the interesting thing about this, um, this last book is that um, I want you to remember something. As I'm talking to you, I'm really talking to myself. Because this book is directed almost totally to the priest of Malachi's day. It is the last word. It is a plea to the priest of that day to stop what they are doing and correct their mode of operation, to get back to worshiping and serving God the way they were supposed to, as directed by Moses in the law and from the Lord when he was uh, presenting what he, his intent was from Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, whichever you want to call it. And in order for us to kind of understand where we are in the story, I have got our chart up on the board that you've seen. Now, if we were to start right here with the year 2011, you've seen the rest of this chart. You've been seeing it for weeks now through Obadiah and through uh, Joel and uh, Haggai. and uh, You've seen this chart. Um, but I've expanded it back now to 453 B.C. because something happens in 453 B.C. that Malachi is a prophecy fulfilled. And in fact, several things in that, in, up here, are fulfillment of prophecy that I want to tell you about before we begin Malachi. <clears throat> uh, and here's the prophecy. <clears throat> it actually comes out of Daniel's prophecy, and we'll be there later on. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 25, and 26, the Lord says this, that he has decreed... For Israel, 70 weeks. 70 weeks until the Messiah, the Prince, will be on his throne and bring in righteousness for Israel and have Israel where he wants them to be. Because even in Daniel's day, Israel is not where the Lord wants Israel to be. 70 weeks. And then in that Daniel passage, starting in verse 24, I mean 25 and 26, he splits it up and he says uh, that there will be seven weeks, then 62 weeks, and the Messiah will be cut off. And then the 70th week happens later. Well, um, the Hebrew there means weeks of weeks. And that means um, whenever it says a week, which is seven days, each of those days is actually a year. So a seven day, um, seven times seven is 49. Or seven times one is seven. You got that? Okay. So each day being a year. So the first 49 um, the first seven um, uh, weeks is 49 years. So from 453 B.C., there's 49 years, and then 404 B.C., the conclusion of the 49, there's 434 years, and then the Messiah is cut off. The Messiah is crucified, so we back up. Well, when we get over to Ezra and the Nehemiah passages, we find out exactly what's there. In the Daniel passages, from the decree to go rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild everything there, to reestablish it, restore it, from that date, there's going to be 49 years plus 434 years. Well, when you go back and you read, we find out that there's a problem over in Jerusalem, that it, its temple has been built but its wall is not built up, there are things not done, and Artaxerxes sees Nehemiah, his um, a trusted cupbearer who tastes everything that he eats and drinks before the king eats it to make sure it's not po poisonous. He trusts Nehemiah. He says, Nehemiah, what's wrong with you today? What is wrong with you? And Nehemiah says, oh, I've just learned bad news from back in Jerusalem. 
that uh, things are not completed. And Artaxerxes then sits down and issues a decree. He writes a letter for to go with Nehemiah, and he says, Nehemiah, I want you to go back to Jerusalem. I want you to get that job done, and here's the letter, and here's the decree, and I want you to take the letter to my folks in that area, and whatever you need, whatever it costs, I want to pay for it out of the uh, treasury of Persia. If you need a hundred rams, get a hundred rams out of the treasury. If you need a hundred uh, 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 lambs, get a hundred lambs. If you need a hundred goats, whatever you need, get it. Get it out of the treasury. So Artaxerxes the first it, uh, writes this decree in five thir four, uh, 453 B.C. and sends Nehemiah off with it. Okay. Then 49 years later, Something has to happen, and Malachi is the completion and the fulfillment of what has to happen. All the rest of what we call the Old Testament is already in scroll form, already being copied, already being passed around. One book is left, and it is Malachi. It has been 50 years since Nehemiah and Ezra and Zechariah have been pinned down on paper. 50 years, and now after this 49 years, the last book, the last word of the Lord comes to Israel through Malachi before the Lord is going to be silent for 400 years. He's going to give his last word, really not to the people, but to the people, but really to the priest, to the ministers. They've got to get on track. They're not on track. Lo and behold, after the next time, 434 years shall pass, and right on schedule, right on schedule, from the decree to the Messiah being crucified in 30 A.D., it's the exact number of years, it is a fulfillment of prophecy to the year. Jesus, the Messiah, is crucified. He is cut off. Then another fulfillment of prophecies where we are today. The Lord is gathering in the Gentiles. It's, often, it's called in the scripture the, the times of the Gentiles. Where the Lord's message was not accepted by the priest. It's not accepted by the Jews. So he's going to take his name and he's going to give it to the Gentiles. And, they are going, and his name is going to be great among the Gentiles. And you're a living proof of that today. This is where we are. We're in part of the Gentile time. Then we've got, we're here in year 2011. Sometime in the future, the church is going to be snatched away to go to heaven to be with the Lord. And during that time is Daniel's last week. His last seven years, which is the time of the tribulation for Israel. And finally, 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 and I've told you this in different ways many times, at the end of the week, finally he has preached who have finally recognized him to be the Messiah, and he turns the people's hearts towards the Lord, and one-third of Israel accepts the Lord and goes into the 1,000-year kingdom, which is in the Daniel prophecy that I was telling you about, and he, he comes into this as the prince, the Messiah prince, and he makes Israel the renowned nation. And finally, he is brought in righteousness, and he's put an end to all of Israel's sin. That's in the Daniel passage. I actually probably should just, I'll tell you what, let me just do that for you. Instead of me telling you about it, it's in Daniel chapter, chapter 9. Just so you get the whole thing. Daniel chapter, anybody want to know what Daniel is? Daniel chapter 9. Um, that's a bad priest joke, isn't it, right there? Bad minister joke. <laughs> Seventy weeks, verse 24, chapter 9 says, Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city, for your people Israel and for your holy city, that is Jerusalem, to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecies, to anoint the most holy place. So 70 weeks. So 70 weeks ends up here. Then we go into that time where all the sin of Israel has been dealt with. The righteousness comes in for Israel at this point in time. Not over here, but over here. All right. Verse 25. So you are to know and discern 
that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, from a decree, and this is, this is 100 years before the decree is going to be issued, folks. It's 100 years he's telling us this. So we're going to have 100 years, and then the decree is going to happen. From the decree, uh, until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, which is right here, seven weeks, and 62 weeks, and something has to happen at that point. Why is there a division if nothing's going to happen? <clears throat> And it will be built again with, with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. So after the 62 weeks or 430 years, the Messiah is crucified, 30 A.D. And lo and behold, in 7 AD, 70 A.D., the temple is destroyed. And destruction and all this stuff just keeps on going. Okay, now keep on going. Verse 27. And you will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to a sacrifice. And grain offerings on the wings of abomination will come one who makes desolate even until the complete destruction. One that is, decre is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So what happens? You've heard it right here. There is an agreement that is made in a covenant for peace. The covenant is broken at the middle of the week. That's part of that 70th week. There's where we go. All right. So with that in mind, let's continue on. We've got, we've got the place of where Malachi is written. It's written in 404 B.C. It is the last word to the Jews. Malachi 1.1. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say... How have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I love Jacob, but I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountain a desolation, and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. We're back in Obadiah, aren't we? We're back in Habakkuk, even though we hadn't studied it yet. We're back in Amos. We're back in part of Jeremiah. Edomite. From the very beginning, whenever Rebekah has the two twin boys in her womb, they are fighting in her womb. Jacob and Esau. If you remember, uh, the midwife is going to mark the one that comes out first. So she ties a ribbon around the foot that comes out first, a ribbon around the toe, scarlet thread goes back in. The Esau is born first, and then comes Jacob. Jacob is a scoundrel. Any way you look at it, look at the history of Jacob, and he is a scoundrel. He lies, he cheats with his mother to steal the birthright of Esau. He is a horrible person. He finally has to flee from Esau for his life. He goes over up close to the Euphrates, and there he's there for 21 years, of which the first seven years he's in love with Rachel, makes a deal with his father, her father Laban, I mean, with her father. And lo and behold, at the end of the seven years, he doesn't get Rachel. He gets Leah, the sister. So he has to work another seven years for Rachel. Lo and behold, at the end of the seven years, 14 years, things are not good. Father-in-law has not been good with him. He has to work seven years out on his own just to build up his own flock. And finally, after 21 years, he's age 91. Joseph has just been born that year. Joseph is not even a year old. He leaves his father-in-law and heads back to, towards the uh, Canaan, the promised land, but it's not the promised land yet. When he gets there, his 91-year-old twin brother Esau sees him hugs his neck, forgives him. Esau's a great guy. Look at everything about Esau in his life. He is upright. He is forgiving. He is loving. He does everything for Jacob he can. He even cries. He's just a wonderful, wonderful guy. But from being in the womb, the Lord says, I have loved Jacob and I have hated Esau. That is in Genesis. It's here in Malachi and it's also in Romans. The same statement. If it's in there three times, evidently it must mean something. And here's what it means. The Lord hates the descendants of Esau and who they will become. They become the Arab tribes who form an apostate religion that Paul calls the great apostasy. Prior to whenever the, over in Thessalonians, the people are saying, Oh, the Lord's coming. The second coming is coming. We missed it. We missed it. We missed it. Paul goes, Whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't understand. 
The great apostasy must come. The great false religion must come first before the second coming of the Lord. And that apostasy has come. It came back in the, in the 600s. It came in and became really a religion in 621, 622, somewhere along on there, even though it started a few years before that. It's called Islam, the great apostate religion of the world that's going to take over the world. What we see in Egypt is a, uh, is a movement that is happening this week. I love it. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. Remember the ten toes of Daniel? One of those ten toes is Egypt. It has got to become a nation under Islamic law. It has to. To be controlled by the harlot, which is the religion of that false religion that is riding those ten nations and controlling them, has to happen. Fulfillment of prophecy. First really fulfillment of prophecy that I've seen in a long time on that major grand scale. So just watch it. Yes, it's going to become an Islamic nation with Islamic law Maybe even in our lifetime. Well, he says, look here. Edomites, you descendants of Esau. Now, whenever the children came out of Egypt, they were in the wilderness, and they're wanting to cross over the Edomite land to go in the promised land. And the Edomites, their cousins, say, you know what? You want to come across our land? Absolutely not. Mm -mm. So what the Lord does is he instructs when Joshua gets in control, they go over into Jericho, they conquer Jericho, and then they go south, and they wipe out the Edomites and scatter them from their land. Some of them go over towards the Palestinians, and the, the Palestinians, the, the Gaza Strip area, some of them go the other direction, and they scatter, and that part of the land becomes desolate, absolutely desolate. Edom today is desolate. There's no, there's no water treatment system. There's no water system. There's nothing's there. And yet, in Obadiah, we saw that they want to go back and they're going to re-inherit it. And here we see it again, verse 4. Though Edom says, we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins, says the Lord of hosts. He said, look, they're going to say, we're going to rebuild and we're going to move. And in some time in our future, we are going to see that area of Edom rebuilt. It has to happen sometime in the future before the church is snatched away. In my mind, that cannot happen during the seven years. There's just no way in seven years to set it up in that desolate part of the area for the whole town this, and Teman to become a capital city again. Because in, in, in Habakkuk 3, uh, 13, uh, that Teman has to be the capital city. It's desolate right now. There's just no way for it to get built up in seven years in time. It has to become a bustling, strong area. They have to be run out of the Palestinian area and run back down to the Edom area. So that's going to happen. So that's in our future after 2011. And, and we don't know if they're trying yet or not. We don't think they're trying. Right now they're still trying to get Jerusalem. They're still trying to get Israel. They're trying to get that for their land instead of going back to the land where they want to be. So that's a prophecy still to be fulfilled. The Lord says, they may build, but I will tear down. And when the Lord says something like that, he means it. They're going to rebuild it, but I'm going to tear it down. And remember what happens. On the day of the Lord, when the Lord returns with his bride, which is us, headed towards Armageddon on the day of the Lord, he goes by the Edomites, the mountain of Paran, the city of Timon, and he destroys them first before he gets to the battle of Armageddon. So... This is a prophecy still needs to be fulfilled. So the Lord is saying, hey, you understand. I hate Esau, and I'm going to destroy them. They're going to rebuild. I'm going to tear it down. It goes on, he says, I'll tear them down. The men will call them the wicked territory and the people towards whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this, and you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. Whenever Israel sees that happening, when it's destroyed just before him again, the Lord's going to see the Edomites are gone. Their cousins, their enemies are gone. They'll say, the Lord be magnified. The Lord, be ma the Lord is great. And may his, his kingdom go beyond the borders of Israel. And it does because it's going to encompass the entire world at that point in time during the thousand-year kingdom. That's going to be right there whenever they finally realize that. But the point that Malachi, the Lord is making through Malachi is not the point about Edom. The point that, Malachi, that there's making through Malachi is the point about Jacob. 
Jacob's a scoundrel, but the Lord has made a covenant with Jacob, and he is going to keep that covenant. He will not change. He will not ever, ever change anything he's promised, and he has promised to be to them what he's going to be, and he's promised that he is going to make them the pristine nation of the world. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. He is going to love Jacob no matter what she's done to him. No matter what Jacob has done to God the Father, God the Father is going to be faithful. Now by this time, by the time of 404 B.C., Israel has not been in control of her own nation. In 606, well, 722 B.C., the Assyrians took over the northern kingdom. 606 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians took over the southern kingdom. 536 B.C., the Persians and the Medes took over the Babylonian kingdom, which controlled Israel. Uh, we're going to get on down to the 330, Alexander the Great, conquers the Medo-Persian Empire, which takes over Israel and takes over Egypt also. Then the Romans come in, basically by 30 B.C., uh, Anthony and Cleopatra Day and all that type of stuff, and, and they take it over. And in fact, Israel does not have a nation at that point in time either. Finally, finally, in 1914, a war breaks out. We call it World War I. And let me back up just a little bit. In 900 A.D., 900 A.D., 900 years, 870 years after Christ is crucified, uh, the Muslims take over is the Israel area. By 1150, the Muslims have built the mosque on the temple area. Okay, another 200 years. We've got the crusades going on in there where the Christians are trying to get it back but we can't get it back. Crusades are nothing, nothing good comes from the crusades except for a lot of dead people and a lot of money spent. 1453 A.D., the Muslims conquer Constantinople and the entire Eastern Byzantine Empire falls. Boom, falls to the Muslims. 1914, World War I starts. The Muslims make a tactical mistake, but it's all in God's plan. All in God's plan. They side with Kaiser Wilhelm and fight against America and Britain and the other countries. Kaiser Wilhelm loses, and so does the Muslims. Britain controls the Israel area. American controls the Arabian area. Britain, in 1948, decides to make Israel a nation of its own again. 2,554 years after Nebuchadnezzar took it away from him. When we get to Hosea, you're going to find that is a fulfillment of a prophecy in Hosea that 2,500 years after they have lost control of their country, it will be a, they will be reestablished as the nation of Israel. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. 1948. They are just now controlling their nation. God loves them. He keeps his promises to them. He promised he'd make them a nation again, and he did in 1948. That was a big deal in prophecy. One of those major deals. Almost like Egypt being having a turn of events now to want to say in form, we want to be a democracy, a democracy that follows the democracy of Islam, whatever democracy that is. And they say they've got freedom. And they say they're a, a, a religion of peace. But there is no peace and freedom in any Islamic-controlled country, as we understand peace and freedom. So when that happens, the Lord will, when, actually when all this transpires, and whenever Israel sees the Edomites destroyed, then they will know that the Lord has spoken. That the Lord is still keeping his, his promises to Israel. Verse 6. Now he's talking directly. He just basically has said, all, all that was to say, the Lord's going to keep his promises. A son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? God says. 
If I am a master, where is my respect, says the Lord of hosts to you? O priest who despise my name. Oh, there's the priest word. I told you he was talking to us, to the priest of Israel. And therefore, we can really translate a lot of what he's fixing to say to the priest to also those ministers who are in the church today because it just fits. Oh, priest who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? The priest say that. How have we despised your name? And the Lord says, you are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? He says, in that you say, the table of the Lord is despised. How, how, how do we despise you? But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Uh, would he be pleased with you or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, when people bring their offering in to the temple, at this point in time, in 404 B.C., all the, let's say the sheep that come in, are put into a pen. And so it's just got lots of little sheep in here. And all the offering comes in for the day. You need to understand, not all of those sheep are sacrificed on the altar of the Lord. Only the best of the best, 10%. The best of the best, 10%, are offered on the altar, and the rest of the 90% are given to the priests who are in the area to take home because they can't own land, they can't farm farms, they can't have cattle, they are just to be priests. They are supposed to be just in the business of doing godly things for God with the people. So they're not supposed to be preoccupied with this or that or whatever. They're supposed to be available to the people. Ministers in the church are supposed to be available to the people. That's what we are here for. You're the sheep and I'm supposed to be available to you. I am sorry that you have to make appointments. I am sorry that you may have to wait two or three days to get in because I've got eight, nine, or ten appointments today where people are pouring their hearts out. The reality is there's some of y'all who, because in the church everyone's a minister and everyone's a priest, it applies to y'all too. Y'all need to be doing some of the listening because you can do it as well as I can. Because in fact, some of y'all have expertise in areas that I can't, I, I don't have expertise in. And you need to be listening to these. But you're all busy doing your work. You've got to cut the pipe and glue it in for the, for the water wells. And you've got to string the electricity. And you've got to provide the income so that you can present your 10% the best into the pile. So 10% can go off to feed those who are in the temple. And the others can go feed the rest of the ministers out there. That's just the way it is. That's the way God set it up. So the ministers are supposed to be available. He says, yeah, look here. You've defiled. You've despised because you've presented blind sacrifices. In other words, the priests in 404 B.C. are allowing this pen of, of animals that are coming in. Instead of being God's best, he's, they're allowing lame animals. Listen, when Moses delivered the law of the Lord about sacrifices, they were to be of a certain age and no older. They were to not have a scratch on them. They were not to have a blemish on them. They were to be perfect, the best of the best. You were to keep the lame ones. You were to give the best 10% of the best to God for His sacrifice. It's the best of the best. And by this time, they are allowing, the priests are allowing, ah, oh, yeah, that one poked its eye out there in a mesquite tree. Yeah, bring it on in. We'll sacrifice. Just put it right there in the pen. They'll do that. The Lord says, take an a animal. You know, you ran that one over with a chariot. Oh, yeah, it's like back, it's back legs broken. Bring it on in. Take that to your governor and see if he'll accept it and cook it up and put it on his plate. See what he will say. I don't want that. I want something good. When I take a tax off of you, I want the best that you have. And yet they're bringing it to the temple to offer to the Lord as their best. And it is their worst. And the priests are not willing to say, eh, that won't do. No, nope. they'll say, come on in. Oh, any animal's better than no animal. Come on, we'll get it in here. We, we, we can take care of that. Look here, let's go on. But now... You will not entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious to us. With such an offering on your part, will he receive you, any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? <laughs> you offer it up and you don't even entreat his favor on it. And then when you do weep and wail, don't you think he's going to answer you? I need, to do a, uh, uh, I need to show you some stuff in the Bible sometime. I'm not going to do it today, but I'm going to mention it today. 
Do you know there are 12 types of prayers in the Bible that God will not answer? You can pray all you want, but He will not answer those prayers. He will not answer those 12 prayers. One of the examples is in the Exodus, the Lord has just told the folks, I want you to do this. Go and do this and destroy them. The people said, Moses, we need to entreat the Lord and pray about it. Finally, they convinced Moses and they begin to pray about it. And out of the cloud, the voice of the Lord is heard by the entire congregation. What are you praying about this for? I told you what to do. Get at it. Folks, there are things in this Bible that tell you how to live your life and you don't need to pray about it one minute. You just get at it because it's God's will. He has spoken to you through this. You may be back there singing that song, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. I want to see you. I don't want to read your word, but I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart. It's a travesty today. We got ministers who want to read one verse and... Who want to read one verse and tell you their soapbox of the day. We got people who are crying out to hear a word from God, and yet they haven't opened the word of God to see what he's got to say to you. You don't even know how he operates. You don't know his character. You don't know what he likes and what he dislikes. You could not even call him father if you just heard about some of the things he did because you didn't know that's what the father did. You wouldn't recognize him because he is not the person, you're, he's given you all of this to tell you how he works and how he never changes and what he likes and what he dislikes. And yet we want him just to magically give us some interpretation of open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. But I'm not going to read your word. No, just tell it to me, okay? Could you just have it come down like on a MP3 where I can listen to it? So that went over some of your heads, didn't it? <laughs> Put it on an iPod for me. Will it come on a Kindle? Now, I want it on the Kindle, but I also want it to t talk to me, okay? Then I'll know it will really work. Oh, my. Uh, God's not accepting that favor. Verse 10. Oh, that there were one of you. I love this passage. Oh, that there were one of you among you who would shut the gates that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. Is there just one priest in 404 B.C. that will say, uh-uh, that offering that you are bringing is not up to God's standards. You may not put it in this pen to be offered to him to the Lord. Is there just one of you? Just one priest who will say, uh-uh, enough's enough. We're not taking defiled offerings. We are not taking offerings that are not up to the standards that God accepts. We are not going to take just whatever comes through the door and say, this is what God wants us to have, so this is what we're going to sacrifice. No. It is all, that fire on the altar is only to be kindled under animals that are under certain age, ages with no blots, no spots, no blemishes, no scratches, nothing, not a toenail out of place. Do, do lambs have toenails? I don't know if they do or not. Well, they don't have one crack on the bottom of their whatever it is, all right? I'm going to have to get close to a lamb to find. I don't want to get too close because I've been close to a herd of lambs once. And behold, they stinketh. They do. Mm -mm. I'm sure glad David was a shepherd king because mm, those sheep. Mm. He says, I will not accept the offering. Is there one priest who will say, I can't accept that offering? Folks, the church today is full of ministers and i got to tell you, there's nothing new under the sun on this, okay? It was happening in my day growing up, and I must admit I was probably one of them too, wanting to do new ways, different ways. Oh, let's, let's God accept this, God accept that. We didn't listen to the counsel of the older guys who'd been through it and always say, God doesn't bless that, he doesn't bless that. And we said, yeah, but that's our new idea. There's no new ideas, folks. There's no new ideas. Uh-uh. Mm -mm. Doesn't happen. There's nothing new under the sun. Whatever's been going to be tried tomorrow has already been tried several times. And if God doesn't bless it in the past, he's not going to bless it in the future. And we will say, oh, but God will, you know, because he said it to me in my heart. And I heard it. Well, can you show me where he acts that way in Scripture? Oh, but God told me he would. 
20 years later. How'd that go for you? It didn't work. <laughs> Sad part about it is I'm of that age now. I'm of the age where I can look back over 30 what, years of ministry and say, look, it, it doesn't work. How many years has it been? Since January 1974. How long is that? 30, 36 years. All right, I can look back. A couple of generations say, mm, you know, there's some things that we tried that didn't work. All it did was lead the people in the wrong direction. Verse 11, For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense is going to be offered to my name, and a grain offering that is pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. He says, look, I'm telling you, if you don't accept me, ministers, if, you, if there's not one of you to shut the gates, I'm going to take it to the rest of the nations. I'm going to take my name, and from the rising of the sun until it's setting, somewhere people are going to praise my name and make my name great. And of course, we know that's what happens. After Christ is rejected by Israel in 30 AD, he begins gathering the Gentiles into what he calls his church. And you know we talk about from the rising of the sun to the setting, but you realize the sun never really sets or, or rises on the world as the world turns? That's a soap opera, as the world turns, wherever the sun is going down and you're going to sleep, it's coming up on somebody who's getting up to praise his name. It's coming up. All around the world there's a continuous praise as the sun for us rises and sets. It just keeps rising. It just keeps rising as the world turns. It keeps setting as the world turns and there's always a people praising his name. When you're asleep, you've got people on the other side of the world who are praising his name. His name is great among the nations. He said, I tell you what, Israel, if you don't straighten up, if you don't ministers, if you don't get back in line, if you don't lead your people in the right way, I am going to send it somewhere else. And of course we know that he does. Talking to these ministers again. Behold, uh, but you are profaning it in that you say, Oh, the table of the Lord is defiled. And as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. You also say, my, how, how tiresome it is. It's, they're just mundane. Yeah, that lamb will do. Yeah, it's defiled. But hey, the Lord accepted. Let's go ahead and slice, slice dice. Put it on the burnt offering. There you go, Lord. Oh, here comes another one. i got to do another one. Okay, all right, here we go. There's no, there's no thrill in loving the Lord. My pet peeve, my pet peeve is to hear ministers say, th uh, today, hear ministers say things like, oh, i got to do a wedding that night. I can't be with y'all. I wish I could go to the movie, but i got to do a wedding. Well, heck fire. Don't we want godly weddings? If they don't want a minister doing their wedding, why... Why do they go to justice of the peace? They want a godly wedding. And you can only have godly weddings with godly ministers doing the weddings. So we go out and get a minister to do the wedding for us. So we have a godly, God-ordained wedding. But the minister's going, oh, I've got to do a wedding. Oh, I gotta do, go, I've got to go do the funeral. I've got to write my Sunday school lesson. I've got to go to men's prayer breakfast. I've got to go over and listen to that guy over there at that other church over there at luncheon. I got to go to a meeting of how to take care of, I got to, I got to, I got to. Ministers, you don't got to. If you got to, go pipe fit somewhere. Some place where somebody says, okay, I need to put threads on this pipe, and if you don't do it, I'll get somebody else, and that's how you'll make your salary. You get to. It is my privilege. As a minister, and in this day, it is a minister. It should not be tiresome. We get up every day, and we're not thinking about when I'm going to retire. We're going to think about how I'm going to serve the Lord till the day I die. I get to be with y'all. I get to. I get to take your phone calls. With joy, I get to take your phone calls. I get to take your emails, even though some of them are so long, I can't read them. I'll email back and say, please email this too short me or come see me. Let's talk on the phone. I get to be with you. I get to do the funerals. It is a privilege to do the weddings. It is a privilege to do the remarriage things. It is a privilege. It is a God-ordained thing that I get to do, and yet... I hear so many guys say, I got, I got to go baptize. Oh, I don't want to go baptize. I got to go back. I get to baptize. The fun part is that when the wig comes off or the, in the water or... <laughs> I've had that, you know. I went over and as I put, I put them down real slow on purpose. You notice that? So that I can tell whether it's real or Memorex on their head. 
<clears throat> and I hold them right behind the neck because if it happens not to be real and it starts to float, I put my finger up there and hold it on the way back up. <laughs> it's not my first rodeo into baptism. <laughs> Been there. Yeah, I get to do it. This morning at 9.30, the lady didn't come out, and I kept thinking, oh, where is she? And the music went on. I'm going, oh, my, where is she? So I finally said her name, and it went out all over the auditorium. I called her name. She came to the door, finally. And I looked, and I said, she's ready. Yeah, she was ready. Here down she came. Took her down real slow. <laughs> Made sure water covered every bit of her. <laughs> Brought her back up to rise in the newness of life to serve her Lord evermore. i got to do that. What a privilege. I wish all of you could have that privilege. But in Malachi's day, that's not a privilege. That's a drudgery. It's a drudgery even with some of the, some of the ministers in the world today. It's a drudgery. You know it's a drudgery because the Lord's not blessing them because they're not baptizing anybody. You know my very first church in Longview, Texas, when I got there, they had not had a baptism in two years. When we started baptizing, to baptize three of the kids that I led to the Lord, the thing leaked, and we didn't even know it till after we'd filled it up about halfway, and it was leaking. Well, it hadn't had water in it in years. <laughs> and then what the problem was, the preacher hadn't baptized in so long, he didn't even know really how to do it. And he was a 30-year preacher at that point in time. And I guarantee you, he had not baptized 200 people in his life. Shoot, some of us around here, we get to baptize that many every year here. Some of the guys, they're on regularly. Mercy. It's fun. Okay, let's go on here. <clears throat> right after the word uh, in verse 13, he says, My, how, how tiresome it is. He says, And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. Sniff at it. You know what that is. Hey, how many of y'all went to public school where they had a cafeteria line? Okay. Now, this is, this is I, I need for you to have the sniffing at it in your brain. You start at the end of the line with your tray. You put your tray on the little four-bar pull thing, and as you go down the line, you do this. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah, I see all those hands testify, you know, heads going up there. And you wonder, what did those little purple-haired purple -haired ladies in the back, back there, they're standing there waiting to serve it up for you. You know, they got purple or blue hair. Did yours have purple or blue hair? You're shaking your heads. Yeah, they did. They fixed it for you. And here you, they're watching you go by going. The priests are looking at the offering going, okay. That's a sniff. That's a sniffing at it. You got it? The Lord says, the host, he says, and bring what you have taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, so you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? Be cursed, I mean, but cursed be the swindler who has, has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. So in this pack, all these have come to be offered as a possible offering to the Lord, and the priest says, no, I want to eat that one. That's the best. Take that one home. We'll, we'll offer this one over here. He got run over by a chariot and got his eye put out with a mesquite tree. Let's offer him to the Lord. You disdain the altar. You say, no, the Lord is not going to get the best. Not going to get the best at all. And the Lord says, look, I'm the great king. I am not going to accept that blemished offering. And now this commandment is for you, O priest. See, he's talking to the ministers. Talking to the ministers of this day, the priest. If you do not listen, and if you do not take to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings, and indeed I have cursed them already, because you are not taking it to heart. Time out. Let's just bring this forward to what happens today. Ministers who do not know the Word of God are trying to proclaim the Word of God to people, and they're trying to say, the Lord will bless you in this if you do this, the Lord will bless you in this if you do this, the Lord will bless you in this, and the, those blessings that they are promising are against the Word that is found in the Word of God, 
And the Lord says, I have cursed those blessings that you are giving out already. They will not come to be. Ministers are supposed to have correct information to give out. Some of you have been a, come to me and you'll say, I need your advice on this. And I will say to you, you're out of my realm. I do not know that answer. I have no idea about that. I have no experience in that. I have never been down that road. Most of the things that I give you advice on are things that I've already been that, down that road. I have stumped my feet. I have bloodied my toes in it. I have a PhD in how to do it wrong. <laughs> and I will say to you, don't go down that road. I did it wrong, and then I found how God said to do it right. Do it right. He says, look, do it with the right heart. If you ministers, you priest in 40 BC, 404 BC, if you do not change your heart about how you're offering things to God and how you're tending the flock, I'm going to curse everything that you do. I've already cursed it. Behold, I'm going to rebuke your offspring, and I will spread refuse on your face, uh, on your faces, and refuse on your feast, and you will be taken away with it. If you don't change what you're doing, I'm going to take it away from you. That happens. In 167 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes comes in and he hates the Jews. He tries to annihilate the Jews. He tries to kill them all. And so he, 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 spreads, pig's blood, he spreads pig's blood on the altar and he stops the sacrifices in the temple. In 124 B.C., John Hyrcanus, who is a Jewish priest, comes around, he gathers a whole bunch of people, and he, he runs out of town the supporters of Antipas Epiphanes, and he re-consecrates the temple, and they start the sacrifices back up. Finally, those sacrifices are going, but they're still going with the wrong heart because they're going under man-made rules. Now, what you need to understand is, by 404 B.C., almost all of the 613 man-made rabbi Jewish laws that they are going to live by like how far you can walk on the Sabbath day, they've almost all been put in place by this day. Not one of them is based on a true passage of what the Mosaic Law is. They all, they're almost all based on some thought of it, so there's a kernel of thought, and that's how it is with everything. Every false lie, every false religion has a little bit of truth in it, and a whole bunch of error, and those 613 rabbi laws of what the, how the people could live and act in Judaism are already in place, and the Lord's saying, I don't like it. He gives them a chance here, and by the time this is, uh, 15 years after this is over, they're right back into the same thing again, and by Jesus' day, they're going to reject the Messiah, who's the fulfillment of the Mosaic Law. Are we on verse 4? Yes. Okay. Then you will know. I didn't know if I'd turn the page or not. <laughs> then you will know that I have sent this commandment to you, priest, that my covenant may continue with Levi, who was head of the priest. You got that? Says the Lord of hosts, My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him as an object of refer reverence. So he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and un unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many back from iniquity. For the lips of a priest, you got it? And let's just go ahead and bring it today. The lips of the minister should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. You know, it was a time where if a prophet gave a, a bad prophecy, he was no longer considered a prophet. I would say to you like this, if you ever have a minister who gives you bad advice, you probably need to find a different minister. You might say, mm, you know, I think I didn't understand him, so I'll go try him again. If he gives you second bad advice, you really need to go find another minister. Because I'm not saying take his minister away from him. I'm saying you go find another minister. You go find another place, another body where you have a minister 
who is going to preserve the knowledge of truth for you. In this day, there were none. There were none that would say, I'm not opening the gate for that lamb to come in, that blemished lamb. I'm not going to open the gate for that offering. I'm not because the word of God says something else must be accepted. But as for you, you have turned aside from the way. He's talking to these priests. You have caused many to stumble by the instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So I also have made you despised and abased before all the people, just as you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in the instruction. If you ever have a priest or a minister who shows, says one thing to one set of folks and another thing to another set of folks, it's time for you to find a different minister. You don't want partiality. It's the same with everybody. Oh, we really need to do this for him because you know how much money he's got? I don't care how much money he's got. I don't. Your money does not talk to me. That's between you and God. Oh, but he's so poor, so we need to help him. I don't care how poor he is. That's between him and God. The question is, is, is the Lord going to provide through me and what I do in this ministry to help the people? And I will know that because whatever they are asking for and what they have a need for, if it's a true need, the God, is, God has provided it for me. It is not my responsibility to put that weight on my shoulders to go make it happen, to go raise the money, to make that happen. That's not the responsibility. God controls it all, and if he wants it to happen, it will happen because he provides the means. Folks, some of y'all know, we, we bought a trailer for a young man, 62 years old, who for 40 years of his life had been behind bars. I did not have to ask one single person for those donations. It just rolled in. I went down and thought I had enough money to buy the first trailer, and I didn't have enough money. I was $2,000 short. So I did not make the deal. I just decided I needed to wait. Lo and behold, within nine days, the other 2,000 had come in. If God tugs on your heart to give something for some reason, there's a reason why it happens. For you to bring that offering... Because the Lord wants you to bring it because He's designing you to help in another deal. And you don't have to know what the deal is. And that letter that was written, that was read earlier, was the result of that. Now, I did dangle out a little carrot out there <laughs> when I gave it to the person. Dr. Ernie, I think you were there. I said, now listen, you know, you've had trouble with this and that in your life for 40 years. The trailer's in Sagemont Church's name, and it's going to remain in Sagemont Church's name for three years. That means four Christmases from now, if you have kept your nose clean, and you've stayed loving the Lord, and you've not fallen back into any of those old habits, we will then transfer it into your name. Why? Accountability. That keeps us looking at Him. That keeps us picking him up. That keeps us watching what he's doing because you and I both know we can love the Lord with all our hearts and promise him forever for nine months and then we lose it. We let it slide away. My job is to tend the flock. That's tending the flock. And so four Christmases from last Christmas, my prayer and my hope that we'll go down and we'll pay that tax because we've got to pay a tax on it because just the way it is, it's the way our government is, and we'll transfer it into his name, and he'll die in that trailer one day. That's his final home, because that's his plans. We have to do that. Our lips cannot have anything on them but the true knowledge. Verse 8, But as for you, you have turned aside from the ways, from the way, talking to these priests, and caused me to stumble. Oh, I've already read that, haven't I? Mm -hmm. Let's go on down to verse 10. But do not, but we do not uh, have one Father. Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously against others, against his brother, so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and Jerusalem, for Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. 
As for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from, his, from the tents of Jacob everyone who makes, awakes and answers or who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts. In other words, they've worshipped another god. In fact, but the truth of the matter is, didn't even have to have Islam come around or anything else. By 404 B.C., they weren't worshipping the God of the Bible any longer. They were worshipping who they wanted to worship. They had made up the 613 rules by which they would worship, and those rules were their rules. It was not God's rules, and they were worshipping a God that did not exist. In the day of Jesus, whenever they're proclaiming to worship God and what God has said and the Moses and everything, they're not following any of that. It's all lip service. It's just lips. They're not even serving the true Jehovah. They're serving the God that they've made up in their mind. They have designed Him the way they want Him to be, not the way He's designed by Moses, because Moses was told by the Lord how God is. Prophets come who tell the truth, but Israel will not listen to them. Hmm. Mm, 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 mm. They've married a foreign God. They've married a foreign God. This is another thing you do. <laughs> well, I, just, I should have said, titled this, uh, okay, another pet peeve. The Lord says, this is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning. <laughs> because he no longer regards the offerings or accepts it with favor from your hand. In other words, they see that there's no blessing coming and they want to know why the blessing's not coming. And they cry out to God for it. Now, they don't want to change their ways. They just want a blessing to come. Open the eyes of my heart. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, but not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then in your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed in your, to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. You know, we can go to Matthew all we want to and talk about how God hates divorce. We can go to, Levit uh, to Deuteronomy and find it too. But really, this is the passage that is the most hammering on us. There are a lot of us, um, a lot of us, there are a lot of people who married young and then decided they married the wrong person so they had to get unmarried so they can go love somebody else. Um, if you are a believer and you're part of the faith... If you find yourself married to someone who is not the right person, you are to love them anyway. You are to not cover a wrong and make a wrong by correcting a wrong. The wife of your youth is to be your wife. You are not to divorce her because God hates divorce. She is your wife. Keep her. You may need to change some of your attitudes so that you can keep her. And it may be that you have to get a little corner in a closet in the room to live with that contentious woman that you married as a child. <laughs> but it's better to be there than commit a sin against the Lord by divorcing her. Don't cover that. Get the Spirit. You've done that without the Spirit. Get the Spirit in you and love her. Love her. God, is what He's saying here is, look, God was the bride of Israel. I mean, was the groom of Israel. Israel's the bride of God. He's going to keep his promise. And that's in the very beginning. He's going to keep his promise. He never changes. Verse 17, he says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, How have we wearied him? In that you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or he says, Where is the God of justice? Come on, bring your offering in. Whatever. Oh, yeah, that offering will do. Don't worry about it. God will take it. Come on in. Yeah, what do you need? Oh, yeah, we've got some offering we'd like to give to the auction for help. Uh, uh, can can y'all come pick it up? 
Sure. Well, you got to pick it up today because, uh, because uh, we've got our new furniture coming and we want to give this auction. I'm sure it'll be good for somebody. Uh, you know, it's a pretty good shape. Now, it's going to need a little bit of cleaning. And um, you might want to see if somebody can uh, stitch it up just a little bit because it's got a little tear on it. But I'm sure it's pretty good if you got to take it and take care of it. And, and um, uh, well, can we bring, come get some? Oh, no, no. It's got to come out today. So we go pick it up. And we look at it and go, you know, if we put that in the back of our truck, it's going to stink up everything else that's back there. But it's a good offering. It'd be good for somebody. They don't want it in their house anymore because behold, it stinketh. We know the good stuff in helping hands. You know how we know the good stuff? Good stuff's like this. Hey, I have some stuff I want to donate. Um, we're going to get some new, but... If you can just put us on the list and tell us when you're coming, it doesn't matter. Any time in the next month. Any time in the next month. You know what that means? They didn't have to get new stuff, and it is perfect. It is absolutely perfect. I better hurry or my time is up. You have wearied the word Lord with your words, saying everything is good. Is That's good. It was good for somebody. And I want the tax write off, too. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Hey, there's a messenger coming. It's going to say, prepare you the way of the Lord. Isn't that going to happen? Who's that? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. That's right. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. Who's the Lord that they're going to seek? Jesus Christ. There's a prophecy right there. The last book of the Bible has a prophecy about one coming who's going to say, who's going to prepare the way, and it's going to prepare the way for the Messiah too to come. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. He's, he's, he's telling the Israelites, look, the Messiah, you've got to change. You've got to get ready because there's one coming who's going to prepare the way, and the Messiah is going to come. And then he skips over and talks about him. He says, hmm, but who can endure the day of his coming? The day of. The day of the Lord. Who can endure that day? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like the refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them at like gold and silver. That's the priest and that they may present to the Lord offerings of righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleased to the Lord as in the days of old, in the former days. In other words, way down here, finally there are going to be some priests. They're going to get it right. Their hearts are going to be right, and they're going to lead the people of Israel to the Lord. And a third of them will change their hearts and will change their minds. He says, then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be, be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages and the widow and the orphan and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Great, when all that happens, he's going to do that. Isn't that the same list of things that the Lord said to the priest? These five things I have against you because you, you say we've got to help the widows, yet you're stealing from them. You say we've got to help the orphans, yet you're, you're stealing from them. You, you say to the people, help these things, but you ministers, you priests, you're not doing it. You say don't commit adultery, yet you're committing adultery with these women. You priest. The Messiah says that to them while he's alive during his three years of ministry. Huh. And he says, for I, the Lord... Do not change, therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. So he's saying, look, if you will get everything right and you will still take care of everything, you will not be consumed on the day that the Lord comes and takes care of all those who are wicked. And in fact, they do. They accept the Lord, they turn to Him, they turn a third of the people to Him, and they make it all the way into the thousand-year kingdom. But he comes back, he says, stop robbing me. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're bringing in these defective sheep, these defective rams, these defective lambs, and you're giving them as if they're your best, your 10%. And you're robbing me. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. 
Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out my blessing on you until it overflows. He says, look, if you will just in 404 B.C., if you will just try this, change and bring it back, get your hearts right, bring the whole tithe in, not defective, but what's supposed to be, bring it in and do it with the right heart and see if I don't just open the whole windows of heaven for you and turn uh, and, and, and bless you with an unbelievable blessing. In fact, he goes on here in verse 11, he says, Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So, when we get into the thousand-year kingdom, everyone will say about Israel, you are a delightful land. Everybody will say about Israel, the people, you are a wonderful nation. He will do the work. He will get rid of all the wicked folks. We don't have to fight wickedness. We do not have to fight evil. That is not our place. When we love the Lord and we are right in His eyes, He does all the fighting for us. When there is something that comes against us that we think is the devil coming against us, many times it is just us inside of our brains thinking up stuff that is evil. It is our heart that's causing the problem. It's not the Lord doing it, and it's not Satan doing it. Now, if you will stop doing those type of things and get totally in line with God, he will rebuke the devourer for you. He will make sure those things do not come against you. But the problem is, is these priests during this time, they're arrogant. They're just doing their own thing. They're not even interested. They're just, just doing it because they have to, because they're the priests. He says in verse 13, Your words have become arrogant against me, says the Lord. Says the Lord. Yet you, met, you say, what have we spoken against you? We're doing everything we're supposed to do. Doing everything you're supposed to do and doing it with the right heart are two different things. He says, you have said, it is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we have kept his charge, and we have walked in mourning before the Lord of hosts. So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. In other words, they say, look, Look, we're offering you what you asked for. I mean, it's a lamb, isn't it? It doesn't matter what it is. We're offering. We're giving this to you. We're doing the charge. I mean, it's kind of an empty thing. It's a vain thing. We just do what we're supposed to do. Isn't that what you want us to do? Just do what we're supposed to do. But we cry before you. We pray before you. But, but in what we do, we're really being arrogant. And we're saying, hey, God will bless this arrogancy. No, he won't bless the arrogancy. Then there are some. There are some with Malachi. It says, Then those who fear the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. What's the book? The book's Malachi. They write these words down so everyone can hear them for the next 400 years. It's a book of remembrance of what the Lord is saying right here. They will, they will my, be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession, on the day that he comes, the day of the Lord, prepare for his kingdom, I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. In other words, those of Israel, he, are, he is going to spare them and bring them in, just like he would spare his own son. So you will again distinct, be distinguished between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve God. It'll be easy. On that day, it'll be easy to know who the wicked are and who the righteous are because of where they stand with the Lord. He says, For behold, the day is coming. He's talking about this day of the Lord. The day is coming like a furnace, and all the arrogant and evildoers will be like chaff. Everyone who is there to fight against the Lord, who is evil, they are going to be burnt to a crisp, just like chaff. And the day that is coming will, be, will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. In other words, everyone who will be cut off on this day will be totally cut off. No offspring, nothing. They will be gone. They will not be in that thousand-year kingdom. But... For you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healings in its wings. Now the sun comes up and it casts its rays down on the earth. The same thing's going to happen with righteousness. Uh, on that day, 
On that day as the Lord comes, righteousness will just beam down on the earth just like the sun beams its righteousness down on, on the sun beams its rays down the earth. And he says to the Israelite people, hey, you're going to go forth and you're going to skip like calves from the stall, it's getting out because you're going to get out from under this bondage and you're going, going to go into this thousand year kingdom and you're going to be just like a free calf who's been pinned up for many, many years. You will tread down the wicked for they will be as ashes under your soles of your feet on the day which I am uh, preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Well, with that, he turns to one more thing and he talks about Elijah coming. He says, remember the law of Moses, my servant. Remember those laws. Remember the statutes. Remember those. Remember the ordinances. Remember those which I commanded him in Horeb. Now, that's the same as Mount Sinai for all Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Before this day of the Lord comes, somewhere in the past, before it, Elijah's going to come. He says, okay, I'm going to send you Elijah, and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Elijah's going to come, and in Elijah's coming, he's coming for the purpose of preparing the way for the Messiah, so that the people of Israel will not be cursed on this day. Now, they miss the Messiah, but he still comes. Well, Elijah comes. Well, he ends that with this promise of Elijah coming. The Old Testament's complete. It's 404 B.C. We'll not hear again from the Lord for 400 years. And then lo and behold, 400 years later, we hear the Lord sending a message to, to uh, Zechariah when he's in the temple serving his proper time in 6 B.C. We hear him say to Elijah, I mean to Zechariah, Zechariah, your wife Elizabeth. I know you're old in age, and so is she, but she's going to bear you a child about this time next year. And they're going to name him John the Baptist. Well, to speed down in time. During Jesus' life and ministry, they come to Jesus and say, Isn't Elijah supposed to come before all this happens? And the Lord says, You know, Elijah is to come, but he's already come. His name was John the Baptist. And he tells us that three times that John the Baptist is the Elijah that was to come. But with that, the Old Testament is finished, and we are waiting. We end the Old Testament with Elijah. We begin the New Testament with the Elijah that's to come. His name is John the Baptist, and from there we go on with the rest of the story. You cannot know the entire story of the Bible without putting it together because it always fits together perfectly. And so it does with the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this word that you've given to us today. Uh, it's been a hard thing for me to actually teach because it's so directed as me as a minister and to the priest of, your, of that day when it was delivered. May we always present to the people the words of knowledge, the word of truth. And may we share with, with everyone what we know to be the fact about you. May we help them uh, open the eyes of their hearts as they seek you by learning about you through your word. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.